day to you. My name is Sean and I'm the pastor here at Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. I'm so glad that you are here with us. You might be fellowshipping with us through broadcast, but we consider you an important member of our Calvary Chapel, Birmingham family. So it's good to have 
you with us. While you are here, do me a favor, and if you haven't already, click subscribe and ring that bell so that you are notified whenever a new video is posted. Also, if you could share this video with your friends and family, that would help us to put faithful Bible teaching into the hands of even more people. I know that many of you give when you are able to attend church, but please continue to give to the church even when you are unable to be here in person with us. Being a small church, giving tends to be small in amount and, well, sparse. But if you don't give, we can't afford rent, we can't afford utilities, and we will be unable to broadcast as we do. Without being here at the church, there are several ways you can give. You can give by mail, either set up an automatic uh, contributions to your bank or perhaps a bill pay service, or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Pelham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online at www.calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, just click on giving, and it will take you to a page where you can give a one-time gift or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please pray about giving into this ministry so we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. All right, welcome to Calvary Chapel Birmingham today. Um, we're going to go ahead and just skip over announcements and uh, get right into the Word here. So before we do that, let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house and worshiping you. Thank you for uh, sending your son to die on the cross for us and uh, raise again, uh, defeating sin and death. Please uh, give us hearing ears to hear what you have to say to us today. Um, bring your word through me. May it not be anything of my own, but everything coming from you. Bless us, time of fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. For those of you who don't know me or don't know me real well, my name's Mark. Um, my wife, Marion, and I have been coming here for almost two years. Um, I grew up in Calvary Chapels back in Southern California before moving out here about six years ago. Um, had the opportunity to um, study at Calvary Chapel Bible College. Um, I graduated from there in 2007, and during that time I spent two semesters in Israel um, studying at the Bible College there, and I was able to intern there after I graduated. Um, I've done um, two and a half years in Israel altogether. I, uh, my wife and I still work with Calvary Chapel Tel Aviv um, whenever we have the opportunity to go out there and continue to minister to the people. So Sean asked me to just come and speak today, share the word with you guys, um, and kind of just um, continue to build relationships. And um, that's one of the things we're going to talk about today, is building and maintaining relationships within the church body itself. Um, to do that, let's go ahead and turn to Romans 14, and we're going to read the entirety of Romans 14 and the first seven chapters of Romans 3. Okay, so Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. The w one person has faith that he may uh, eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats... Um, is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, um, another regards every day alike. Each person must be clearly convinced in his own mind. 
He, obs- he who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not uh, one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, who, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you, again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, so the Lord, or says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall praise or give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of your food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is evil, or I'm sorry, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we shall pursue um, the things which make peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything which your brother, by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemning or is condemned if he eats because he is eating, because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each person of, uh, or each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever is written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through, the, through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant to you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may, um, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ accepted us to the glory of God. So, it might not seem like it, but this passage really does focus on relationships and an almost parallel passage in 1 Corinthians, which we are going to cross-reference with, significantly brings knowledge into um, this. These are key components to discipleship as we're going to see through this. But setting the stage, the diversity of the church, and it's important that we recognize that we are talking about members of the church. We are not talking about those who are outside, the unbelievers or the heretics. We are talking about you know, brothers and sisters, believers in Christ. Um, and so that, that, that's you know, really important as we focus on this. So, the diversity of the church displays Christ's power to bring dissimilar people 
in genuine unity. Yet Satan often works on man's unredeemed flesh to create division and threaten that unity. This, the threat to unity which Paul addresses in this passage arises when the mature or strong believers, both Jews and Gentiles, conflict with immature or weak believers. The strong Jewish believers understood their freedom in Christ and realized that the ceremonial requirements of the Mosaic Law were no longer binding. The mature Gentiles understood that idols are not gods and therefore um, that they could eat what had been offered to them. But in both cases, the weaker brothers' consciousness were troubled and they were even tempted to violate their conscience, um, a bad thing to train oneself to do knowing that the mature Jews and Gentiles were able to understand these struggles, Paul addresses them in most of his comments throughout here. Uh, but we will see that God addresses, or Paul, um, God through Paul addresses both the weak and the strong here for their own edification. So we see deep cultural roots here. You know, both both Jew and Gentile, you know, these deep culture routes, uh, roots no doubt played into uh, the doubts of these new believers. These Jewish believers found themselves uh, with the ability to suddenly leave their comfort zone. You know, they had been brought up in this culture, and we see this even with believers in Israel today, where the Tanakh or the Old Testament along with the oral Torah, is part of their everyday life. It's so woven into who they are, where they live, and what they do, that they have a hard time leaving it. You know, they, they don't continue on in it because you know, they believe it holds you know, a key to the salvation. It's just, this is what they've done since they were children. Now all of a sudden they can turn on a light on the Sabbath. They can drive a car on Shabbat. You know, th this is very unusual for them in a lot of cases. You know, the Gentile believers, the Gentile new believers, just pretty much had their whole religious and philosophical world shattered. You know, these people were polytheistic. They worshipped many, many gods. You know, and these gods were all self-serving, and they promoted an atmosphere of self-service um, within them. So when you're coming out of that type of culture, you know, these people were unsure if those idols they once worshipped still had any power. You know, they were almost superstitious, holding to some of the um, beliefs that, you know, the, these gods were evil, even though they had no power whatsoever. So both of these groups of new believers would cautiously be exploring their newfound freedoms and beliefs. They lack a but they lack a clear understanding of how everything works. And more importantly, they lack an ability to communicate with their new Christian family. So I grew up in the church. You know, I, I grew up in Calvary Chapel. The, the church culture is nothing new. But even me, when I moved out here and started dating my wife, um, I went to a Southern Baptist church for a little while. That church has a different church culture. Even though I understood the basic premises of the belief structure, I didn't understand the inner workings. I didn't understand even some of the language that was used. So, you know, you think about these different terms that churches use um, every day as we communicate with each other. You know, w when you're coming from the outside, those terms don't have the fullness of meaning. Th think about starting a new job. You know, we, we have computer coders back here you know, they, they could talk to most of us, you know, about their job, and it would go completely over our heads, right? If my wife and I, we're both paramedics, talk about work, there's very few people in this room that would understand the, the jargon or the lingo that we're using to communicate with 
each other. And if I were to take my wife to California where I used to work, she would understand less than half of what we're actually saying. So this puts people back on their heels, right? When you're in a new you know, subculture, when you're in a new place, you're generally put on the defensive, correct? You know, so when we're put on the defensive, we're hypersensitive to what we're saying and how we're acting. You know, especially those of us who have some social anxiety built, built in there. You know, we're constantly thinking about what our movements, our body language are saying, you know, how we're going to phrase things, you know. And so, you know, we're overthinking, we're hypersensitive to um, any deviation from our old normal as well as trying to mimic, trying to blend in with this new normal, you know. And we're doing this because we're trying to establish relationships. You know, this is a big transition for these people. You know, they were not necessarily weak in their belief system, Piper writes, but they were weak in the application of their belief. Not knowing for sure how to function in their new reality. This led to strict adherence um, to the perceived rules, though does not drift completely into legalism. Their abstinence from meat and wine is just that. It, it doesn't, um, it's not because he, these people believe that this behavior um, in any way makes them justified or secures their acceptance before God. We notice in this passage a lack of condemnation um, for these people, for them being weak and being strict adherents to the rules. Whereas the Judaizers in Galatia were brought under very harsh criticism by Paul, you know, because they were spreading a false gospel. You know, so we can't think of these people as legalists, you know, because they weren't trying to earn a, God's acceptance or contribute in any way to their justification. You know, another way of putting that, these people weren't willfully ignorant. They, they were ignorant because they were new. They, they needed to learn, and most of them wanted to learn. So, it's because um, it, it's at this juncture where we start to see some friction forming. You know, so, if we look at verse 3, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt one who doesn't eat, and the one who doesn't eat is not to judge those, uh, or is not to judge one who eats, for God accepted him. The, the combination of the unease of the new believers and the inability to communicate effectively, and that ability stems from that lack of biblical or theological knowledge, and the ability to encode or decode, and yes, I'm using computer terms, but in language, everything I say, I encode my thought, put it into English or whatever language I'm speaking, and present it to you, and then you have to decode it and understand um, what I'm saying based off of the words I use and my um, actions, my non-verbal cues, the context of the situation, everything else. So, you know, when they were talking with the strong, they don't know how to ask the right questions. You know, we see this a lot in new people, right? It, it, in whatever job we're in or whatever class or school we're in, we don't know how to ask the right questions. You know, and then when we do get answers, you know, we feel like, hey, everybody's always talking above my head. I have no idea what they're saying, you know. I, and I know what I want to say, but I can't find the right words to say it. And these people keep misunderstanding me. On the other side, on the flip side, the strong people are like, why are these people keep asking the same questions? Why, why, you know, why can't they get it through their thick skulls that this is the way things are? You, know, you get frustrated with questions that are perceived to be absurd or unintelligent or repetitive. 
You know, this is where the friction comes in. This is what breeds the frustration. This is and what causes that contempt to um, eventually come out if these situations aren't rectified. So contemptuousness is what separates friendly intellectual debates or just regular conversations from the pointless disputes that Paul addresses in Titus 3, verse 9. And you guys can look that one up on your own. But these conversations, these minor disputes, or these minor debates, are really teaching opportunities for the strong and learning opportunities for the weak. So if we fail to take advantage of those opportunities, if, if we allow our frustration and our contempt and our judginess to show through, these um, debates turn into disputes because of our overheated emotions. You know, they're fueled by resentment, confusion, anger, and even self-aggrandizement or pride. You know, what was meant to unify and edify the body becomes divisive, and it's marked by self-preservation and self-denial. You know, whenever our beliefs, you know, are challenged, we have that natural tendency to preserve ourselves, to defend ourselves. You know, and if we're not having open, honest conversation where we are allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, our pride and our self-preservation um, instincts are going to kick in, and we are not going to listen to the people who are presenting either a problem to be rectified that they don't understand, or um, solutions um, to the problem that we're presenting. So if we look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21, we see um, several deeds of the flesh that Paul writes about. And these are evident in um, these disputes. So when we go from debates to disputes, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, and now we really key in on these disputes. Enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, and envying. Also listed are drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Think about the political realm today. Think about how much... Enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, and envying are taking place. You know, when, when we have interdenominational disputes over small things, you know, are these things cropping in into the church? You know, these are deeds of the flesh. They include despising one another. And they are really eerily similar to the false teachers that Paul warns Timothy about in 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrines conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arrive envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of a depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So, as we allow these fleshly deeds, these, these things that our flesh wants to do to, out of our pride to prove that we are right, you know, we are at risk of mission drift. We are at risk of our doctrine drifting into where we're not supposed to be. You know, that this is why as this flesh creeps in to our conversations as a church body, we need to deal with it. And we'll talk about dealing with it later on. But, you know, Paul is laying the foundation here in verse 3 about what, what the problem is and how this is arising out of pride on both sides. So moving on to verse 4. 
Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So, this is not doing away with accountability among the, the brethren. The, the, this is giving us, in fact, another layer of accountability, because everything that we do, you know, we're going to be examined by Christ. You know, but we don't know exactly what the Lord is working on in each individual's lives. You know, we, we don't know the, the projects that he has, has them doing. You know, so when you're, when you're at work and you get assigned the special project and you're allowed to, you know, deviate from your standard lunch break or you're allowed to come in late or stay late and your coworkers don't know what's going on, you know, they see you not doing your regular job and they see you having all of these, all of these benefits, you know, they, they, they don't know, um, they don't understand that you are still accountable to your boss. Your boss has moved you into this position because he, he wants you to work on something specific. He wants you to accomplish a certain goal or he wants you to improve in a certain way. You know, we, we don't know what's going on in each other's lives all of the time. You know, so we have to be sensitive to the fact, and if our brother is not falling into sin, you know, if, if these are relatively gray areas according to Scripture, and that's what's being addressed here in this chapter, you know, maybe the Lord is working on them in a specific way. But like I said, the accountability comes um, from Christ. If we look at 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5, Paul writes to the church, but to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of man's heart. Then each man's praise will come to him from God. You know, motive is a huge thing. You know, we, we can do good deeds and be motivated by bad things. We can be motivated by self, building up ourself. You know, Hey, look, I, I'm so I'm so good at this, and even if I'm not standing on the corner as the Pharisee does, you know, but I'm I'm doing this in such a manner where I'm looking to build pride in myself and have myself displayed, you know, that that is that is sinful, you know. So the motive here in this chapter for these people, you know, whether they eat or don't eat, whether they worship on the Sabbath or don't worship on the Sabbath is it, it is is a big thing. Um, mo moving on to uh, verse five in Romans fourteen, one person regards one day above another, and another one regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. So, like I said before, you know we still face some of these issues in the church today. Maybe not so much in the U.S., even though it is here, but working with congregations in Israel, there's actually a big debate over when Christian churches should meet. You know, the Sabbath comes in on Friday night. So Jews hold services Friday night and Saturday morning, and then Sunday is Monday. So Sunday, everybody's up early and going to work. Like, so you, you get half a day on Friday and a full day on Saturday as the weekend, and that's about it. So there's practicalities. It's really hard for churches to meet in Israel on Sundays because everybody who works is not able to attend. You know, so you, there's also impracticalities about meeting Fridays and Saturdays. 
for those who can't drive, you know, for whatever reason, most people there live in big cities, so parking is a nightmare. You know, think about parking downtown Birmingham. You know, Tel Aviv has 1.5 million people in the metro area. So it's like parking downtown all, all, all the time. So most people who live in these regions don't drive, but public transportation is shut off Friday night and Saturday because the Jews want to observe the Sabbath and do it as they believe it should be done. So how do you get people to church? You know, how do you get them to meetings? You know, fortunately, um, there is some forms of public transportation that do run on the Sabbath, and they, they'll, they'll charge you extra. But, you know, and then there's the food issue. You know, a lot, like I said before, a lot of these believing Jews will still keep the kosher law, not because it's, you know, something they hold to for salvation, but it's something that has been such a part of their life that they don't know how to let it go. You know, big progress, like I said, is turning on a light on Saturday or starting their oven on Saturday because that's against the oral Torah. That's against the traditions. You know, so, you know, some of these people will never get as far as eating, you know, the pepperoni on the pizza. Uh, but, you know, just, just be aware that this, this stuff is still out there today. Verse 6, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord, or for the Lord, and he who eats does it for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. So, at minimum, these things we're talking, or at maximum, I'm sorry, these things that we are talking about are second-tier principles. They, they have nothing to do with our salvation. They have nothing... They change nothing as far as our understanding of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they don't alter our relationship with God in any way, shape, or form. You know, wh wh what we're talking about in this chapter is gray areas, personal convictions. You know, and, you know, as a church, you know, we need to be more forthcoming with what is first-tier principles? What are second-tier principles? You know, what are the absolute non-negotiables? You know, I think we are pretty good with establishing first-tier. You know, we have statements of belief, doctrines, creeds that all help us clarify what the scriptures are saying um, as far as the first-tier principles. The second-tier principles and below are areas where the church is generally weakened. You know, the type of worship we did today would not be accepted by a lot of congregations. But it's neither here nor there. It's not sinful to be up here with the guitar. You know, we don't have to do hymns only, but there are churches out there that believe that. So, you know, when we're debating these things, it is important to remember what tier we're arguing to. Um... Verse 7, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So, we are called, in Luke 9.23, Jesus says, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is the self-denial. This is the removal of self from the equation that we saw earlier. This is the hardest part. This is where the sanctification is taking place on a daily basis. You know, and we're doing this because we are not our own. If we look at 1 Corinthians 16, 19-20, or do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So 
one of the ways we glorify the Lord, as we're going to see in this chapter, is through unifying the body around godly principles. Verse 10. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. Yeah. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue uh, shall give praise to God. So, the author of Hebrews reminds us that no creature is hidden from his sight, but all things will be opened and laid bare um, to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's Rome, uh, Hebrews 4.13. Yeah. So, how does this take place? Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, and I'm sorry, I know I'm throwing a lot of cross-references out there, but the best way to interpret Scripture is with other Scripture. You know, now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show, will show it because it is to be revealed by fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work, and if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet, as, yet so as through fire. What we do, how, how we present ourselves, and how we lead others by example is um, part of this building on the foundation. Our, our works are going to be passed through the fire, and you know if our works cause somebody else to stumble, if our deeds cause somebody else to stumble, it's going to be revealed through this judgment. It's going to be burned away, and it's not going to be remaining. Romans 14, 12, uh, 14 verse 12. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to the Lord. Like we've seen, we have to stand before God and give an account for everything that we have done, whether it is sin or not sin. But it is important to understand that leaders are held to a higher standard. They're held to a higher accountability. And it's not really clear where the author of Hebrews draws the line when he's talking about your leaders. Because in Romans, you know, if your actions are causing somebody else to stumble, if your example is causing somebody else to stumble, you're held accountable. So, you know, you can be a lay leader without being behind a pulpit. You can be a lay leader without being an elder or a worship leader or a deacon in a church. You know, fathers, mothers, you're leaders of your children. You know, it's not an official office, but you're supposed to grow your children. You're supposed to lead them in the ways that they should go. You know, so Hebrews thirteen seventeen. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. You, know, you, you never know who's, who, who's looking up to you. You never know who views you as a leader. We're in the cycle of discipleship where, we're all, where we all should be being discipled, but we all should be discipling. You know, it's the same thing that we look for in producing EMTs and paramedics. You, know, you should always be learning from somebody who knows more than you, somebody who's better at the job than you, but you should always have the outpouring into somebody else. Because if you don't have it, that's where the growth cycle stops. That's where the re reproductive cycle stops. You know, And it might not stop completely, but it can stunt the growth. And this is something we're going to see. You know, So it's really important to understand where you are in that discipleship cycle with people and where you are in that leadership cycle. You know, as biblical leaders, you know, 
we will need to voluntarily restrict our Christian liberties as well as our responses and options in different scenarios. You know, if you know your kid's watching you, you're going to potentially respond different to, you know, situations. You might not yell at the driver. You know, you might not, you know, speed down the interstate. You know, you, you might handle that miscommunication with more grace because you're trying to be that example. Yeah. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave um, to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so I might win Jews. To those under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so I might win those under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law. Though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So I might win those without the law. To the weak I have become weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I will I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I can be a fellow partaker of it. You know, Paul's talking about doing what is necessary to establish the relationships. You know, he's establishing these relationships by humbling himself, by denying himself, you know, by putting himself under the law to save some, by bringing himself out of it to be able to communicate with others. You know, sorry. E even though, um, yeah. So we're, he's looking to establish those relationships, looking to build those relationships, even in these areas where people are weak, the people who choose to remain under the law. You know, e e e even though their beliefs might seem off, you know. We're free from the law. Why, why submit yourself to that? But we've seen cultural reasons. You know, so even though people's beliefs seem insane or absurd, if they line up with what um, Scripture allows them to do, Paul brings himself in line with those so he can build them up and so he can have those conversations and potentially change their minds, bring them into a little bit more liberty. You know, give them some security in their um, in their place in the church. Moving on to verse 13. Therefore let us not judge one another, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean, but to him who thinks it's who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food um, him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let um, what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is a conscious choice. This is one of the hardest things to do, right? To, to purpose in yourself to deny yourself. You know, every time we're faced with these situations, every time they present an option, you know, do we choose the high road? Do we prefer our, our brother in everything? You know, but this is one of the most important applications of selflessness in the church. This is how, like I said, we build those relationships. This is how we make those connections. Hey, I'm not better than you. You know, yeah, I, I'm going to refrain from this so I don't cause you to stumble. But in return, let's open up conversation. Let's have good um Bible study. Let's delve into the Word and see what it really says. You know, can we come to a conclusion? You know, that is satisfactory for the both of us. Can can we grow each other? Can can you possibly teach me something? Maybe something I didn't know. You know, being the strong one, 
as the week one, you know, there's definitely a lot of things that we don't know when we're on the weak side. That's why we're asking. Sometimes we don't even know what we need to ask for. You know, do, do you know what you don't know? Or, you know, do you know what you need to know when you don't know anything about it? You know, that, that's, that's that high level thinking. You know? But these people who have been through it before, the strong people who are able to break things down scripturally can point out this knowledge. And, I, and I'm not talking, you know, some, you know, Gnosticism, you know, different type of gospel, but how do we wield the sword in our daily lives? How do we walk according to the scripture? You know, so that way we show clearly the love of Christ and the invitation of Christ for others to come. How do we build up one another in our daily walk and how do we become more Christ-like as individuals and as the church? The, uh, fr the phrase, do not destroy him with your food, um, for whom Christ died. We're not talking about somebody losing their salvation here. MacArthur points out that the word destroy is normally, um, normally refers to complete devastation. Um, in, in the New Testament specifically, it is often used to indicate eternal damnation. But in this context, however, it refers to a serious devastation of one's spiritual growth. So we're not condemning somebody to hell, but we're seriously stunting their growth. You know, that, that's a big thing. You know, people with stunted growth rarely become productive members of society um, spiritually. You know, that, that stunting of spiritual growth often manifests itself as the breaking of relationships and communication lines being severed. These people have been treated so bad, you know, and they were so convicted by what others' actions had led them to do that they choose to just pull out and not be a part, not associate with the body. Uh, and therefore, their uh, growth is damaged. The strong are left powerless to pass on the essential truths about everyday Christian life and the liberties associated with it, and their testimonies are rendered, rendered null and void in the minds of the weak. Yeah. And this is simply due to the fact that oftentimes the strong approach this process without love. You know, the, the discipleship process, the leadership process is lacking love. It is sterilized, you know, my way or the highway, you know, come in, do a book, you know, hey, here, here's the list of rules, don't deviate from them, Roger, we're all good. You know, the weak suffer in their growth because they lack exposure to that wisdom. You know, you can't learn what you need to know without being exposed to it. And we can get it out of Scripture but how much more is your growth helped by somebody who's more mature in Christ than you coming alongside of you and walking with you through these things? You, know, you, 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 you can't just get in a, a plane and fly it. You have to be shown. You, you can read the instruction manual, and you might be able to figure it out, but it's still not going to be smooth. It, it's still not it still might not be carried to, you know, the most desirable of conclusions. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, Now concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, and knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So love is very important. And this is an interesting passage because I've done a lot of study about knowledge in scripture. It's one of my, one of my things, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm one of the weird people who likes school. I, I like to keep going to school. I like to, you know, understand how, how the world works, how everything works. Um, and I'm like, how, how does knowledge play into this? Because throughout Proverbs, Knowledge is spoken of very, very highly. 
And its derivatives are even more praised. The derivatives being wisdom, which is a theoretical application of knowledge to a given situation, and integrity, which is the actual physical application of that knowledge and wisdom into a circumstance. So it's knowing the correct path and taking it. You know, so why is knowledge derided here by Paul? And we can conclude that this is in reference to specific knowledge based off the context. You know, that knowledge being the knowledge of things sacrificed to idols and that that knowledge is being misused. Those are two very important things. Because we all know that knowledge misused can be devastating to a situation. You know, if you let things told to you in confidence out into public, that can ruin a relationship, correct? You know, if, if you let classified material out into the world, you know, all sorts of things can happen. So, remember that love must be present in everything we do. It is the qualities of love that help transform knowledge into wisdom and wisdom into integrity. Because if we don't love somebody, you know, we might know how to help them, but you know, we're not taking that extra step to move from wisdom to integrity in that case. In both Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8, we see knowledge being used um, in a way that demonstrates a lack of maturity on three different levels. Those that, first we see those that don't have knowledge. They're lacking even a fundamental didactic or book knowledge of what's going on. You know, 1 Corinthians 8, 7. However, not all men have this knowledge, but being accustomed to the idol, uh, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it was sacrificed to an idol, and their conscious being weak is defiled. So they don't have the knowledge that these idols are, are not gods. They, they are completely powerless. You know, those that have knowledge but don't understand the ramifications of their actions is the next one. These people are lacking wisdom, that proper theoretical application of knowledge. Here we see knowledge providing a false sense of confidence. We can go out and we can do this because we know that we are at liberty to do this. You know, how many of you guys realize that you change an environment just by your presence there. Your body heat increases the temperature or decreases the temperature in your environment. Your breath creates air currents, and much less any action that you take can change a situation. You know, at work, I can step into a really, really chaotic situation, and just by my presence and my demeanor, I can bring calm to that situation. New paramedics, new EMTs don't understand that. That's something that they um, that they need to learn. That's something we need to learn as believers too. Our very presence can affect this. You know, so if we don't think through our actions, if we don't have knowledge of all the poten- or at least some of the potential consequences, we can't think through to the point um, where we might be hurting somebody else. 1 Corinthians 8, 11 through 12. For your knowledge, uh, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died, and by and so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against God. So your actions might not be sinful in and of themselves, but because you were weak and didn't foresee and somebody else um, might sin, you sin. You know, so be conscious, be thinking through things. And the third level is those that have the knowledge uh, and a full or at least a fairly good understanding of these ramifications in their actions and choose to completely disregard others. This, is a, this shows a lack of integrity and through both the Romans passage and the First Corinthians passage, Paul is moving the strong, um, the ones that have knowledge 
from the previous category into this one. He is making them accountable. He is showing them the ramifications of their actions. So, in doing so, he increases their level of accountability. Romans 18, uh, 14, 18. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God um, and approved by men. You know, this is reflecting back to verse, verses 7 through 9 where we see dying to self. You know, we are urged to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable um, to God, which is your spiritual service. This sacrifice is manifested through the fruit of the Spirit, which we see in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So, our living and holy sacrifice is presenting our bodies, according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. And the, how we display that to everybody else is through the fruit of the Spirit. So, there we have the acceptable to God and approved by men. Because against the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law. Verse 19, so then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the one who gives offense. It is not good um, to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything which, um, or by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he um, who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. 15 verse 1. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us um, is to please his neighbor for uh, his good to his edification. So, you know, verse 19 says, you know, we should pursue the things that make peace. Paul echoes this earlier in Romans, where he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. He's putting that responsibility on you. You know, don't, don't be argumentative. D don't seek to cause strife within the body. You know, this brings us back to relationships. Remember how I said our entire reproductive cycle or system as believers comes back to those relationships. You know, first off, ours with Christ, because that's the only way we become believers. That's the only way you know, we become cleansed and have the salvation. And then ours with those around us, because that's the only way we be the only way we become disciples and the only way we disciple others. So we have responsibilities. If, if you're the stronger party, um, your responsibilities include to accept the purposes of the weak. We see that in Romans 14.1. Not putting up obstacles or stumbling blocks. We see that in Romans 14.13. We are to pursue the things that make peace and the building up of one another in verse 19. And we are to bear the weaknesses of those who are without strength. And we are to please your neighbor for his good and his edification. We are to you know, bear with people. We are to build them up. We are to come alongside them. You know, we, we are in a spiritual battle. It is down and dirty. It is tough to keep moving forward. You know, when I'm 14 calls into a 12-hour shift and I've been to the hospital, you know, 10 times and, you know, been chewed out by the nurses, the, the thing that can make that terrible day really good is a good partner, somebody who understands, somebody who comes alongside you, somebody who supports you. You know, it, it's hard for 
e even, you know, a good friend outside of that realm to be that support because they don't understand. They haven't been through it with you. That they, they, they have They don't have that comprehension. But us as believers, we have that commonality. We have that that body. We know the spiritual warfare. We know our spiritual struggles. We have that ability to communicate with each other on that really deep level and provide that awesome support. And in that, we build each other up. We keep each other going. You know, but the weak are not without responsibilities in these in this circumstance. Edification implies that they are to be learning. You know, you can't just stand still because at, at the point where you stand still, you're really moving backwards. If you're willfully ignorant, that ignorance becomes sin at that point. You know, so the weak conscious needs further instruction, according to F.B. Meyer. It is anemic and requires the hilltop with its further view and bracing air. But in the meantime, its owner must be guided by its promptings, and a man must not take a certain course uh, merely because others do so, um, unless he can justify their bolder faith and larger freedom. By thought and prayer and the study of God's word, conscious, or conscience becomes educated and strengthened and ceases to worry. He says, Paul is basically writing, do the best you know, and when you have adopted a certain method of life, follow it humbly until the wider view is open before you in the Spirit of God. Remember, we're talking about gray areas, so nothing outside of Scripture here. The main principle for us all is to live and die to please